just trying, we were just trying to figure out the, the order of really the song. Oh, yeah, for the Chinese. Yeah, Chinese. yeah, yeah, yeah. they call me in uh, Heilong in China. Heilong? Yeah, for well, sure, Heilong. What does that mean? Yeah, oh, dragon. Uh, yeah. Oh, thanks, Esther. Do you want to say Chinese? Huh? Do you want to say Chinese? Oh, huh. Wow. I never knew. I thought, wait, what's your heritage? Japanese? Taiwanese. Taiwanese. Ah. Oh. Cantonese? No, just Mandarin. Yeah. Do you speak fluent Mandarin? I used to pass, but now it's shit. I just know, like, get by certain phrases, yeah. Yeah. But, yeah. Uh, if I had a Chinese girlfriend back then, maybe I would be fluent, but <laughs> yeah, if you don't use it, you lose it. Have you talked to Zhang at all this week? A little bit, but she's busy. She's doing her thing. Yes, yeah, and you are too. Yeah. Izzy, what is, what is your? Uh, you're pretty active on social media. Mm -hmm. What is your What is your strategy on social media? Because it it could be very positive, could also be you know a negative thing. Yeah, I mean that's the balance. That's the yin and yang of social media. But fight week, I have time. <laughs> I have time on fight week, so I like to let the week go by fast by interacting with people in a positive way, but also in a negative way. And that's not always like a bad thing for me because I like to feel, I like a little bit of venom, you know, just a little bit, just a little <laughs> taste. And I have to give it back as well. But also the positivity, I like a little taste of that. But if there's too much positive, then I have to like just feed the trolls a little bit. And if there's too much of that, then I feed the positive a little bit. So it's all about balance. And, I've, and it helps me get by, by fight week very fast. How about non-fight week? How important is social media to like, you know, branding, marketing, that type of thing? Mm, yeah, for the money, yes. I mean, posts right now, each post I do for certain brands is like right. five figures, six figures. No, five figures right now, but wow. probably six figures eventually. But, um... Yeah, uh, for me also, I just, I fuck around on this sometimes, just like, cause, yeah, yeah I'm me, you know me, my Twitter's a little bit R18 sometimes, my Instagram's <laughs> alright, uh, I say some shit that you guys wouldn't say, cause you have, you know, blue collar jobs, but, um, yeah, it's just, it's fucking social media, people read too much into it sometimes, and, like, one thing I notice is, like, a lot of people, if, can you like follow me? Can you follow me? Or like, if they get me to yeah. follow them and they know me, then they're like, first thing is, wow, two million followers, and then like, <laughs> then the attitude changes straight away to like how they treat me or how they react to me, and I'm like, you wouldn't treat me this way. If, <laughs> it's fucking followers. Like half of the people that follow me just want to see some chaos. They want to see me <laughs> fucking fall. They don't really did like a lot of haters. They they follow me. I'm like, why do you even follow me? And they'll talk shit about me. And I'm like, you don't have to follow me. My page is open, so block. <laughs> Yeah. Do you try to maintain like a certain persona on there? Nah, fuck no. Yeah. <laughs> persona, no. So there's no strategy to it? Nah, I just, I, there's a method to my madness, but most of it's just free flow. Right. Mm. Izzy, you're rightfully getting a ton of credit for taking a fight here that you didn't have to, but in your heart of hearts, do you feel like you're catching Romero at a time that he's either been exposed or, or a, a fertile time for you to take care of him? Hmm, it's a good question. That's a really good question. Let me think about that one. So Robert Whitaker beat him twice, right? Um, I had him winning the, the, the second fight, but Robert Whitaker beat him twice. And not once did anyone say, oh, but he's 43, he's 40, whatever. But when I beat him, that's gonna be the excuse. But beforehand, everyone's saying the same thing you guys are all saying is, oh, he's a specimen, he's out of this world. He's a guy that does this and that, and rah, rah, rah. I think I'm catching him at the right time, and he said he, he, he feels the best he's ever felt, even when he was 20-something. That's his own words. So when I beat him, I don't want to hear any excuses. I, I want I want my fucking credit. I want, you know, oh, you beat the baddest motherfucker, quote-unquote, by you guys, the scariest motherfucker in the middleweight division. And that's why people remember my name. Did anyone try to talk you out of this decision? I mean, you're getting like almost a, a mythological reception for, for like walking into jail on the first night and finding the toughest guy. Yeah, oh yeah, actually, like, find the Tucker's guy, punch him in the face. That's how you, that's how you secure your space. <laughs> um, no, nah, no one tried to talk me out of it, not my team. Try to talk me out of it. Maybe, maybe, I think Dana, but not because of, I think he just said, nah, like the UFC, the UFC just said, nah, they don't want to do that fight because he's coming off three losses. And that's fair enough, but I requested the fight because I understand what, what is a stake for myself. How much uh, time do you put into thinking about your walkout song? Not that much, no. It just goes through what I, it, it comes to me, like I was just doing an interview with ESPN. It comes to me like, like I'm a vessel. I just take the messages that I get from the creator. And yeah, um, I don't really put too much time into it. Also like it's something that like my last one, I, I played that track as part of my playlist during certain hard workouts, certain deep rounds. 
So then when I hear it, it triggers that memory, that flow state. So yeah, it's not really like a right all that kind of. Is it just like what you just hear it on the radio feel, or hear it on Spotify yeah, and you're like, feel. that's what. Yeah. It's all about feel. Whatever I'm feeling, like this this next walkout song is. I don't, I don't really. It's not even on my playlist, but I just heard it on my old phone and it was just record, like recurring. I was like, just feel, just feel. Can you say what it is? Nah, it's a surprise. It's not crazy, but it's, yeah. it's nice. It's it's gonna flow well. It doesn't matter like the genre of music or anything like that. I don't. Huh, you've seen me walk out to different kind of music. I, I'm I'm a guy with different tastes, so I don't really discriminate when it comes to music. Were you inspired by any other fighters with the walkouts? Mm, Chris Nassim Hamed, as a kid, he was my first boxer I can remember early on when I was like three or four. I remember just was the aquarium, the little box TV, the radio station. I remember sitting in the middle just watching him just like mesmerized at what he, how he came into the ring, his flip, and then just the way he just played with fighters. That was one of my earliest memories of, of showmanship, of boxing, of fighting. Russian Prince Nassim Hamed just fuck with people, but yeah, he just owned it. He owned it, and that's what I'm doing as well. I'm owning it. Do you think he inspired you to fight in general? He's one of the guys I definitely take inspiration from, but he's not. He's not the one that inspired me to fight. No. Is the UFC missing personality when it comes to walkouts and showmanship? Uh, a little I mean, bit? Dana said, you know, or he, even he told me he doesn't like that kind of stuff. That's why they turned it down from Melbourne. But I was like, nah, it's my show. Um, but I mean. Dana's Dana, you know, and he's one person. The world is full, filled with many people, many billions of people, and I feel like through just being yourself authentically, you can really tap into something that everyone can relate to. And it's not really just about walkouts or anything. Just sometimes it's the way I speak, my demeanor, the way I dress, the way I eat, the way I chew. But, um, yeah. How have you been able to find the human decency to avoid this shoey movement? <laughs> so I did it once, only ever once, and that was in, I think, Adelaide, and that was out of my own shoe. That was out of my own shoe. Also, Australia, they're crazy cunts. Like, for me, I'm a Kiwi, I'm a black Kiwi. We do things a little different. Um, so I did it out of my own shoe. That's the only time I've ever done it. My mom was like, you're never doing that again. <laughs> and then some chick recently at the prestigious award show, she tried to like, she tried to like, get me to do a shoe out of the cameraman's shoe, and I was just like, you stupid? <laughs> and then my mom says, yeah, she seems like an idiot. So, yeah, respect to my mom for that. You said you take some inspiration from different uh, fighters and entertainers. I feel like you take some from pro wrestling uh, as well. Yeah, definitely. I mean, the Attitude Era was my era, bar none. That was my era for wrestling. It was real. It was fucking real to me. My sister used to like, <laughs> well, you can see. I'm like, shut up. It's real to me, damn it. <laughs> nah, but, um, yeah, uh, eventually, you know, I, errors, like, I don't know, I wasn't used to the new guys and the new mm -hmm. format, like, it got too soft for me. But the Attitude Era, jumping off the Hell in the Cell, the Elimination Chamber, Mankind, also Undertaker, yeah. I think he jumped onto on tables, like shit like that, Jeff Hardy, Hardy Boys, The Rock, <laughs> fucking Stone Cold John Cena, like, and on the mic, I think, uh, definitely some of the charisma the Dwayne has, The Rock has, like, yeah. rubbed off on me, because I used to just sit there and just watch, and just like, Wu Tang Pie eating the, like, yeah, I just, it, yeah, I, I was a fan of that, and I'd just be laughing. He was, it was, he knew how to put on the show. Same with Stone Cold, and everyone else. So definitely, it would have rubbed off on me as an influential young kid. The Rock did okay after wrestling. He did all right. Yeah, yeah I mean, he's, he's all right. I mean, he's, he's, he's doing some stuff. I think he's all right. Yeah. You've accomplished a crazy amount in two years in the UFC. Considering people are talking just as much about you fighting Jones or going to heavyweight, mm -hmm. how detailed is your next two-year plan right now? It's very detailed, but you have to be able to account for variables. You have to be able to adapt to certain things that aren't foreseen, you know? Like, you can't, you can't plan everything. You, you have a certain degree of planning, but at the end of the day, life's going to say, fuck you. And you just have to roll with it. So that's one thing. A lot of people who like to have too much control uh, where they fall is because they want to have the ultimate, no, this is how things are going to go. This is my way. But you have to be able to let go. Like... I think I learned that, not recently, but like a, year, a few years ago, Eugene, one of his last few fights, kickboxing fight, was it a kickboxing? I can't remember, but yeah. I learned it from him when he just said, I've done all the work, there's no need to stress, and he just let go. My last fight, I took that on board, and I just, there was no need to stress, I knew I did all the work, and I just let go. You surrender yourself, surrender to the will of the universe, and you just, just let go, just flow. Is it fair to say that 
super stardoms on the line for you in this fight? Yeah, a lot's on the line. Fucking a lot's on the line, you know? Not just for me, for your for your Romero as well. But I mean, I don't know what the odds are saying. I don't really I don't really care. For me, I feel like the underdog. I feel like the underdog. I feel like people want want to see me eat shit this fight. I feel like people want to see me fall this fight. Especially because I'm, you know, this is the nature of the beast. This is the nature of what we've created. We like to build people up, build them up so much, and then just tear them down because we see inadequacy in ourselves because of the way they're shining. And a lot of the times, people, ah, I hate, I can't stand this guy anymore. And they'll find any reason, and they'll be reaching for any little thing, you know. And it's like, just say you don't like me. It's it's better for your own conscience. It's better for your own soul. If you don't like me, just say like something. If I don't like someone. And you don't have to like everyone. Like certain people I don't fuck with just because of energies. But I just don't associate with them. But I don't go out of my way to like... Because then I'm still focusing on them. You know what I mean? So if I don't like someone, I just avoid them. Champ, now that you have Boulder on your waist, how's your life changed in terms of like a lot of hanger-ons? Did you have to tighten your inner circle or anything like that? 100%. Oh man, the leeches are everywhere. Um, fucking the snakes, the vultures. You know? But the thing is, vultures only circle around dead, deceased creatures. And I'm thriving, I'm living. But I see them circling, because they're hoping I'd fall, they're hoping I'd die soon, but this is, <laughs> they'll be circling for a long time. And for me, I've tightened my circle. There's definitely been a lot of people I've cut off. There's definitely a lot of people I've cut off, um, recently even, as recent as this week, because why tell the truth when the lie's more entertaining, you know? Why, yeah, I'll leave it at that. But like, there's a lot of people in my life that I, I hold dear to me. But there's a lot of people that definitely I just don't fuck with anymore because it's unfortunate. Just not all your homies can grow with you. Not all your people can grow. Even family for some people, not everyone can grow with you. And that's okay. It doesn't mean you don't love them any, anymore. Or don't love them any less. It's just like, ooh, I just have to keep doing what I'm doing, and you're dead weight. So die. The last question had to do with the word superstar. Mm -hmm. You perked up. Have you seen that stadium right across from the Mandalay Bay? And have you thought about every walking down drive. a ramp or something like that? Because you know, time, you know, the time. UFC's based in Vegas. They're going to want to occupy that stadium. The stadium have you pictured right? it? Have you pictured an opponent? Raider Stadium. Raider Stadium. It's called cool. Allegiance Stadium, but yeah, it's where the Raiders. Called? Allegiance Stadium. Allegiance. But that's where the Raiders are going to play. I like the name Allegiance. But yeah, I, I mean, you've seen me talk about it. You said 2021. You know how I'm, I'm going to fight over there. But every time I drive from the PI, every single time I drive past, I see it. Every time it's getting built. It's getting finished closer and closer, and it's so beautiful. Like, like what's his name? Um, Rich Eisen said, the Death Star. It looks like a Death Star in the middle of Vegas, and it's just, it's just cool to watch. It's just a beautiful, shiny, glossy black bowl, and yeah, definitely, I see myself fighting there in 2021. Do you just picture a figure across from you, or do you see faces already? Well, I know who I'm gonna fight there, but you know, we know. Have you talked to the UFC about this particular? I just, I mean, Dana knows. I already said it, so they know. Everyone knows, and yeah. But first things first, him right there. I gotta take care of him. Um, that's the only thing I'm focused on right now is him and getting past him. Because if I don't get past him, all what I have in plan falls to the wayside, and I have to restart from another level that I, I don't want to be at. So I just keep going forward, and I just keep, yeah, focus. Well, Israel, can you talk about it? yesterday? You kind of mentioned it a little bit how this co-main could be the, the fight of the card. I mean, why were you saying that? I mean, what intrigues Man, you about that fight? I'm telling you, isn't it International Women's Month, right? It's International Women's Month. I'm telling you, if you're a fan of fighting, if you're a fan of skill, if you're a fan of will, if you're a fan of technique, you need to watch this fight. Because, you know, they say, oh, you fight like a girl. That's an insult. Even I see girls say that. So if I beat a girl sometimes at beer pong or ping pong or something, like, oh, you got beat by a girl. Like, don't you realize you just fucking sunned your own self? Like, you just diminished your own sex because you said I got beat by a girl. So what, you're lesser than me because you're a girl? Trust me, I spar with some girls like Jenna at my gym, and they, they, she's southpaw. She's a good look as well for Romero. She's bigger than him, but she definitely gives me some work. I'm telling you, this fight, the co-main event is going to be the fight of the night, or it might be a one-sided. I don't think it's going to be one-sided. It might be a quick finish or a fight of the night. Man, you don't want to miss this fight, man. And especially the ladies, if you're if you're like if you want to support girls, if you want to really show support for girls, watch this fucking fight. Who's your pick? <laughs> Izzy, I saw you um, collected a good, nice little collection of Porsches earlier this week. Mm, yeah, a couple. Which one did you uh, take in today? Today I'm still. Oh, I'm in yesterday's one actually because they haven't swapped it out yet. Uh, I'm in the black one. I'm in the black one, and. Um, I don't know which one the, the 
today's one will be different. I think I'll pick it up when I when I get back to the, uh, the hotel. Is it important for you to like have fun during fight week and the build up to it? For myself, yeah, definitely. But I mean, the Porsche thing is not really part of the fun. It's just business, you know. It's business as usual. But for me, I like to have fun during fight week. I said it my last fight week. I said, when I'm having fun, I'm the best in the world. And I had fun, and I stayed the best in the world. Do you feel like you've been knocking down doors and opening doors for young fighters who want to show their personality and do the things that you do out there? Yeah, definitely. And I'm, I'm not saying, like, you know, you can do the whole cut a promo thing or try and be Kobe or Cringe King. That's still part of them. People don't want to acknowledge that. They want to try and make it like, oh, that's just, you know, um, WWE type antics but well, I'm like nah that's still part of them it's it, when it's time to fight they fucking fight we're not doing the woo, all that kind of stuff we're actually fighting this isn't fake shit this is as real as it gets but yeah I feel like me just being authentically me like I think the guy Dana used in, in the past was Gunnar Nelson and said like he doesn't say two words or three words more than that but he's still an interesting character because of who he is he's just himself so I think young fighters should just be themselves. Don't look at me and try I want to be like that. Just cultivate your own your own identity. Yeah. And I definitely have looked at guys like Ali, like I said, Prince Nassim, Anderson Silva over the years and taken inspiration from them. But over over the, over time I kinda cultivated my own identity. Has it become bigger than fighting at this point where it's not just what you do in the octagon, but everything else that surrounds it? Yeah, I mean my work comes home with me all the time, so that's why I'm moving. So um, yeah, I just wanna, it's bigger than fighting, but at the same time, I'm still me. I'm still a young kid who's just living his dream, you know? So I wanna keep doing that. I don't wanna be, I'm not your guru um, as, uh, what's his name? What's the, uh, fuck, I can't remember his name, that escapes me. Big giant man, motivational speaker. Tony, Tony Robbins, <laughs> my bad, fuck. <laughs> I know the name, it just escaped me right now. Sorry, Tony. Um, yeah, you know, I'm not your guru. Last thing, you spend a lot of your life being a little bit different, being the outcast. Do you still feel like you're the outcast in the UFC? Constantly. Uh, I know that people are embracing me and stuff like that, and then I get a lot of attention, a lot of love, a lot of um, perks. I like the perks. But I feel like the outcast. I feel like the guy that... I talked about it on Joe Rogan Experience a little bit, like, um, what do you call it? Imposter syndrome a little bit. I don't know if that's exactly it. Sometimes... You have to, you know, I know I belong here. I fucking belong here. I've proven I belong here. But there's a little bit of that sometimes. So I feel like an outcast in that sense. And I have to keep proving myself every time I step in that octagon, every time I step in this arena of the media, every time the camera on me, I, I, there's a low key side of me that feels like I have to prove myself right. Israel, are you the greatest dancer of all time in the UFC? No. Definitely not. I'm just I'm just a kid who likes to have fun. I don't know what it's because I said I like to dance. So people think, oh, he thinks he's the man of dancing. I'm the man of dancing, but I never said I'm the greatest. Who do you think's the best in UFC history? RP Brian Jimmo, he's pretty good. Yeah, I like his style. He was a man. He was a man. Um, I never really got to meet him. I never got to see his style completely, but I would have liked to dance him. But no, I definitely will smoke most people in the UFC, if not all. Did you ever do dancing with the stars? That's later on. That's that's later on after fighting. Yeah. Not, not definitely during fighting. But I'll see. I don't know. Maybe not. I don't know. Depends. Do you get paid for that? Okay. Yeah. Oh yeah. Definitely. Oh yeah. We got to talk. Yeah, yeah. I was like, huh. I don't do shit for free. Yeah. No free plugs. Yeah. If you get paid, the money's right. Probably after fighting. There's been a lot of talk about the way we score MMA fights. Oh, man. Huh. Are you someone that wants to know the score as you go in your fight? I think so. I mean, Max Holloway was the one saying. Um, we're the only sport in the world, or one of the only, like you don't know the score until after the fight. It's like stupid because then there's a lot of room for errors. Like I've seen promoters in China fuck up scorecards against my teammate, even Blood Diamond, like my closest teammate. Like they fuck up the scorecard, you know, like because they want their guy to win. But if all fight sports, like after the round's done, like they do in the commentary, you know, they have the, you know, this is what I give the score. You should have the judge and the judge's face as well plastered there. This judge scored it, this judge scored it. And then also, fucking hell, we have 10 points, right? That last round with Kelvin Gastelum, if I was a judge and I was using all the 10 points in the 10 point muscle set, I would give that fight, because I also grappled him, I out grappled him, outstruck him. I would give me a 10-4.
You know what I mean? Why this 10 fucking points? Why you, what, oh, 10 8. Ooh, he rocked him a little bit. I fucking rocked him four times. I dropped him four times. So use, make it a 10 4. You know, use all the, all the points. You know, what's so wrong with that? If maybe, example, the, the Whitaker fight, the round one, I can give that a 10 9. Oh, no, no. At the end, 10 8. That's definitely 10 because I, I dropped him. What's another one? What's a good one? Wait, wait. Brad Tavares, the, the fourth or fifth round. I can give that like a 10 7, 10 6. Use the points. It's fucking 10 points. And make a group chat. Fucking hell. It's not that hard. Who do you have to talk to? Like, just make a group chat. The 12 to 6 elbow. Who agrees that's a stupid rule from 1993 when some dumb commissioner said, oh, saw ice breaking or whatever? Make a group chat. All oppose. I all in favor. Cool. Done. Change the rule. I don't know why it has to take six years to change the fucking rule. It's so stupid and it's frustrating. So just make a group chat. I don't know. Fuck. Yeah. What do your parents think about you fighting? Because initially they were against him. Nah, they, ah, they're here. They're my corner people. They're, 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 they're in the corner right there. They're, the, um, they're smart. My dad especially. He's a very, he's a very smart man. Like, I, don't do, I don't do his genetic, genetics justice all the time when it comes to books. But I'm smart in my own way. But he's a very smart man. And he is a soccer fan, a football fan. So now they watch every single UFC. They watch every single fight night and they'll watch all the fights and they'll watch all the middleweights on the fights and then they'll study them and even for this fight my dad's given me some pointers on what to do against Romero and what to not do against him and it helped me in the fight and it's common sense but it's it's effective I know it's going to be effective so yeah they're always there to support me and my brother David as well he's got a big voice like mine so they put him right in front so he can see and project his voice as well and tell me what to do because he's very smart he's a very he has a very good IQ for fighting as well, so yeah, they're big fans of the sports now. So, and that's the same thing for Nigeria as well. Nigeria is starting to like pick up on MMA, and they they stay up to 4 a.m. to watch my fight. And I feel I feel proud of that. You know, I want to be the guy that shuts the country down when I fight, and then they can party till the next day midnight because I, I dominated. How long did it take them to embrace you getting into fighting though? They supported me from the jump. They didn't like it, but you know, if you can't beat them, join them. And eventually, they joined me. It didn't take long. I think when the money started flowing in, they're like, ooh. <laughs> all right, all right, all right. We can make something happen here. Israel, I was just talking to Luigi and you said that back in China, everyone knew about Halo. Halo, yeah. Mm -hmm. yep. This is sort of a Chinese car between you and China. Can you yeah. tell us a little bit about that experience in China and maybe offer an anecdote about how you just kind of water down the back China was an experience that you can't buy, you just have to do. And a lot of people couldn't survive there. A lot of people left. Um, there, there, there was a program we kind of had. It wasn't an official program, but a lot of people left because they couldn't hack it. It's not for everyone, you know. Living in the middle of nowhere, 20 minutes away from the nearest city, fucking training every day, um, eating like almost not prison food, but like off metal trays. Um, but traveling all over China, fighting every other weekend or every weekend for some people. Like it's not, it's not for everyone. But it definitely gave me a lot of experience for all this, all this shit, China. I had a lot of cameras in my faces. I used that as practice. Being stared at by people, China. Like a lot, I went, we fought at some places that were so rural that they'd never seen a tourist before. They'd never seen a black person in real life before. Like, they'll just be... So all that, I use it as practice. Like, I have the record for staring contests with old people, and I win every time, you know? But yeah, I mean, it's all practice. Being mobbed by fans after the shows, practice. China was good practice for that. So it wasn't just for fighting, but for all this shit. China was a good practice for that, and I'm grateful for my time in China. Well, I don't go. Uh, I just think kick, this was early on in my career. I think kickboxing just took over, and I was just doing so good at that. But I was always training grappling. I was always training grappling. Um, yeah, I was just so good at kickboxing that we, 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 we honed that base first, and that was already my, my bread and butter stand up, so we just honed that first. All the guys on your team, between Kyle and Dan, two really different kinds of people you've seen. Yours is really the order, actually, and so, you know, once you got here, you've been on fire. So, can you sort of just tell us the benefits of taking this from the first game? I said it early on, I said it, um, I, I want to get here and be able to fight the best in the world. I don't want to be the guy that like, excuse me, that just gets here and then like, oh, crash. You know, so we took our time, we made sure we fought different styles, different people from all around the world, 
different codes. And then when it was time, when you were, I was ready in 2015, but we still took our time. And I think it was 2017 I got signed. 2018 I had my first fight. So it still took a few years to get there, but you can never be too ready. What do you think to uh, Dan's upcoming fight against uh, Dustin? Oh yeah, I like that. Um, I haven't really looked too much into it, but hmm, I like that fight for Dan. Is that it? Okay. Boom, I'm at. What what does self expression mean to you in your fight? This is martial arts. I think even Bruce Lee said <laughs> something about that. I've seen him talk about self expression in martial arts. It is it's exactly that. Expressing who you are, expressing what you feel inside because it's mixed martial arts and art is subjective not everyone's going to feel your expression but like example I don't want to I'm not trying to throw shade I love the guy Tyrone Woodley he's a dominant champion he was a dominant dominant champion he was a guy that he was a guy that um, you know he beat Robbie Lawler he's a guy that was a good champion for, for his era the brief era he was champion, but his style wasn't really aesthetically pleasing to me. You know what I mean? But I'm just one person. I'm just one person. There's fucking millions, thousands of other people that enjoy this style, that love his style. And it doesn't take away from his dominance or his skill set. But aesthetically pleasing to me, it wasn't like Sean O'Malley, he's a guy I like to watch fight because similar to my like stand-up style. He uses a lot of things that I like to use and it's aesthetically pleasing to me. And that's the artistry. I love to watch that and see him express himself. One of his moves, I use it to hit the Italian. And you've seen on the on the um, on like all the highlights, it's one I, I, I spun around and I kicked him with a left kick. I stole that from Sean O'Malley. I never threw it in my life. I never threw it in training, but I just in the fight I just kinda remember because I think I saw him that week as well. So it just kinda came to me, I was like and it landed right behind the guard of um, the Italian. But expression and that's a guy that I can who's another guy um there's another guy uh Mahoney Benjamin Mahoney from Australia boxer from Australia I love watching him box I love watching him just shadow box even just because of the way he flows he's expressing and those who don't get it don't get it and I'm not everyone's cup of tea I'm not everyone's expression and that's okay but you can never deny dominance that can never be denied you know for this camp I a good friend of mine, a friend of yours as well, Mr. Josh Hanger came up. Hey, my man, Hanger Tings. Yeah. That's my so, guy. Look, uh, that's what I was going to ask you. Are, are we going to maybe see a Hanger Team? I mean, so at, the, at, at the open workout, you, you saw me with the guillotine and a little, a little ting, you know, but um, depends what he presents to me. Depends what he presents to me. That's one thing when they, people shoot, he has no neck, he has these traps, but I want to squeeze those traps down and find the neck, if possible. You, when you look at the style matchup right here, you know, he's one of those guys that likes to lull you into a false sense of security and then kind of rush at you and explode real fast. It's much different than, say, a Robert Whitaker who you just fought, right? Yeah. Who likes to put pressure and likes to maybe overextend. Did, is that, did you train differently for that? I mean, or are you, like, like we talked about, are you just a guy that goes out there and just lets it be? Let it be. It's, it's, there's a certain amount you can train. There's a certain amount you can train. Um, but at the end of the day, there's variables, there's audibles. Like in, in, the, in the Whitaker fight, from the locker room, I started doing something different with my, my hooks from the locker room. I didn't really do it throughout the camp. It, it was already in my arsenal, like as a fighter, all my weapons. It was, but I just had to use it in a while. But in the locker room, it was just the feeling I was getting. And then in the fight, even my cameraman, Jeff, was like, I've never even seen you spot like that before. But he's only known me like a, like a few years, like six years. And I was like, bro, in my younger years, in my career, I was very good at counterfighting. That was my base. So I was always countering while people were attacking. And I, could able, I was able to see in between the shots. Um, but yeah, I, I don't think I did. I kept the same energy with, with, with training for the best fight of our life. That's the same energy we kept. And this is the best fight, biggest fight of our life. So we kept that same energy. When you talk about energy and you talk about self-expression, I mean, what we've been talking about, you know, a lot of people say fight IQ, say this, say that. It's part of it. it for you, it seems more like com like being comfortable, right? Like, once you get comfortable, once you understand, you can make a couple reads, is, is, is it become like almost like the game slows down for you? Yeah, 100%. Like the Whitaker fight, 
example, as he was falling in the uh, the first round, I saw that happen in slow motion. I saw the way his eyes looked as he fell. And it, it was, it's hard to believe for those who don't fight or who don't compete, all the keyboard warriors, but it wasn't slow motion for me when that happened. The second knockout or knockdown was a little bit faster, but the first one, when he fell, I was like, his eyes I hit him. And I went in for the kill. Well, if I maybe if I didn't admire my work, I might have had that split second to land that last shot. But yeah, uh, it's just feeling and feel it. Like a lot of people don't like to, you know, oh woo woo crystals, you know, Reiki, whatever. But it's not about that. It's, it's real. Like we are energy, you know. And when we fight, there's an the exchange of energy. There's a push and pull, like the waves of the ocean, you know. And yeah, people who don't fight will never understand or who don't feel that or do something similar would never understand. So they'll just think it's just woo woo shit. Well, you know, you you dance. You're, you're a dancer, right? I mean, yeah. you spend a lot of your life dancing and yeah. learning the understanding, understanding movement and how it feels, feeling a rhythm as yeah. you're out there, right? Exactly. I mean, when I look at your style and I watch you fight, to me, it, it seems like everything's based off. Everything is based off of how you how you feel or push, like push to pull. It. When he moves, you move. When you move, he you make him dance, move. Yes, right? yes. Is, is that how you? How you think about it as well? A little bit, yes. Um, like, I have to be able to impose my rhythm on him because he's going to impose his really, really slow, rapid rhythm. And my rhythm is different, so I can impose that on him early on unless he wants to change the rhythm up. And if he does, he, he could surprise me and just come out guns blazing, hoping to catch something. And I have to adjust my rhythm on the fly. But, yeah, it is about that. Do you think dancing is something that really helped you out in your martial arts? 100. I think the, the creativity, the timing, the distance control, the on beat, the off beat, a lot of correlation between dancing and fighting. And yeah, you know, it's, it's what I do. All right. Well, to get out of here, the last question: You got any prediction? I mean, I, I know a lot of guys don't like to do predictions or whatever. But I do have a prediction, but I don't want to give it away because if I do, then he'll know. The prediction itself. Well, I have three ways I feel this fight's gonna go. Yeah. Tired, dude? Yeah, I'm good. So, brother? Yeah. All right, man. I won't hold you long. Man. How you good, brother? I think we're doing a biography on you. Yeah, I know. So, yeah, I have a lot of questions to ask. So, I don't mind. That's, That's all. what we're here no. for. You're a good man. Thank you, sir. Hey, listen, I appreciate you taking the time. I wanted to ask, I was standing there yesterday when you came out for the public workout. And you walked by me, not that you said it to me, you were kind of saying it to yourself, and you said, who can beat me? Who can defeat me? I heard you say that. Yeah. I wondered, when When did you start saying that and, and believing that? Uh, a long time ago, for me. It was a track, I think it was um, I Can't Stop by Fox Pavilion. And Kanye West did a remix to that song. Uh, and it's, who gonna stop me? So I was kind of like ad-libbing that to it, but it just, it felt right. I, 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 yeah, I'm glad you remember that. I was like, yeah, who gonna stop me, huh? Yeah, um, it's been a while. It's been so long, because I've just always visualized and seen all this happening, you know? So the only person that can stop me is me, you know? This is my fight to lose, so I just have to stay true to myself, and I'm gonna win this fight as always. That's what I thought, because I, you can hear a lot of things from fighters or people in general, and but, uh, when they, when they mean it, you, you can you can pick it up. And I thought to myself after you said it, I thought, I don't really know who could. Yeah, that's right. No, you're right. Like sometimes you can re you, can, you can't fake the funk. Even if you're not feeling, there's some sometimes in the past where I've not felt it. I don't try and fake it. I just go with it, and eventually I start to feel it. But you can't try and fake the funk. You try and fake the funk, the funk will fake you. So for me, yeah, you can tell it's authentic. But to me, when I really say shit, I believe it. Now, with, uh, with Romero, he's, he's like a tank. He's going to come into it probably, you know, you know he's going to want to put you down on, on the mat. Uh, so you're probably going to want to be uh, keeping keep him at a distance, I would imagine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Distance, distance management is going to be very key in this fight. So managing my distance correctly and efficiently. George St. Pierre once said, when I was speaking with him uh, about the sport, he said in his dialect, one mistake can change everything. Now, I had I heard uh, uh, Yolo say that about, about you. He's going to wait for you to make a mistake, and then he's going to take you out. Mm. But that could work the other way also. Thank you. You're a smart man. Exactly. <laughs> Thank you. But the thing is, I won't wait for him to make a mistake. I'll force him to make the mistake, and then I'll take over. 
the last thing I want to ask you about is, do you have a McLaren? Do you drive a McLaren? Yeah, I put them on my McLaren. It's a 720S. It's not bad. It's a nice little whip I, go, uh, I have for my Sundays or Saturdays. I, I'm amazed because, uh, you know, I go back and I remember the McLaren, you know, was real big in Formula One, of mm. course, uh, as a designer and a driver and so yeah. forth. And uh, I'm even more impressed that you have a McLaren than a Ferrari. Yeah, I mean, for me, it was... Uh, Coming up, it was always the Lamborghini. Whenever I used to drive my beat-up car, if whenever I changed the gear shift, I always pretended to paddle shift, like just practicing in my head for when I have a sports car. But then when I test drove both of them in the same day, the McLaren felt more, more me, felt more me. And also it's a Kiwi invented car, Kiwi made car, so I just fit everything about it. the car. Kind of chose me itself. And even the, I think in Melbourne, it's the 19th of May. They invite or March. They invited me for the F1. Well, I'll see um, where I'm at after that. I might have to do a USA tour, so I might not be able to make it. But yeah, for me, I, I, I take things as it comes. Yeah, but I like the, I like the McLaren. That's my that's my baby. Put on. Well, just uh, keep your eye on the prize and I keep concentrating on what you have Saturday night. And uh, good things will happen for you. Very deserving man. You're a, you're a great ambassador for the sport, and I appreciate it. Thank you, sir. I really, that thank you. That felt genuine. Thank you so much. I'll shake your hands. I'm going to hold the right, camera. No, I didn't mean to be rude. That's all good. But no, no, you're good. You weren't rude. Thank you, sir. Good, man. Bless you, yeah. brother. Thank you, sir. Strong, yeah. I will. All yes, right. Man. Thank, Thank you. you. Sorry, good. The leather jackets right now. Oh, right now? Yeah. yeah. Right? I like it. I like it. You want to play? What I want to know is, like, can you pop it like some? A little bit. A little bit. <laughs> a little bit. Yeah. I probably want you to dance how you're feeling right now, Izzy. I know you're pretty yeah. weighed. No, I'm not one of those that gets lethargic. I'm just enjoying the, the process. I'm, I'm, I'm a pleasure to work with and fight with because I don't get grumpy to do it for any weight. I enjoy the process of fight with, you know? Not all of it, but you accept it and enjoy it. How unusual is it? You are sitting basically at cat corner from your opponent. Have you been looking over there a little bit, sizing them up? Yeah. No, not really. I'm just focused on myself. Right. Right. Yes, yes, yes. Last question is, has it been harder for you to train to get the belt? Because you've got a lot of names on your resume. you got Whitaker, Gasla, Silva. Has it been more difficult to train to win it? Or is it more difficult for you now to prepare to do that? No, same energy. Every time I fought was always like I was fighting for the belt. Every single fight was the biggest fight of my life. So my last fight was like I defended the belt. This fight's going to be the same thing. Hey, good luck to you. Looking forward to some fireworks on Saturday. My daughter's nickname is Izzy as Izzy. well, and so she thinks she will take it. Uh -huh. She can try. I know. Hey, hey Jeff. What's up, brother? Once you win on Saturday night, notice how I say once you win because I keep it positive. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. For anybody, I got to stay up, Jeff. Of course, of course. Yes, yes. But, uh, you know, recently I heard your coach saying that uh, you still have a lot of guys in the division. you got to clear out. Hear me out, though. I'm looking at the division, and I'm thinking, okay, there until he, he's not ready to come see you yet because he, he's got to win at least a fight or two. Cannoneer is going to be on the shelf until the end of the year, and then you look further down. It's, it's well, like no, this guy's the year. Kind of, really? Yeah, that's what I heard. He's not coming back to the fall because he has an injury. Uh, I, I heard about that, but I didn't know it was going to take him out to the end of the year. I think uh, that's what he said on uh, social media. Yeah. Oh, he might get like get some supplements from, from Paula Costa. You might come back in two months. Here, here's what I'm thinking, though, man. I would love to see you go up to 205, challenge John Jones if, if you get past Romero, of course. Yeah, definitely. That's what I'm, my main focus is him right now. But you now there's other guys in the division. There's guys coming up, younger ones um, like the Sabajan kid. Um, and there's a few other ones. The Joker, he's got a fight coming up. Chris Weidman just came back down. I like that. I like that. So I want to clean out the division. Like, I'm not going to be one of these guys who just holds up the division for no reason. So I'm doing, I'm doing right by the division, by being an active champion, a true champion. Is that kind of your mission statement in 2020? I know you're not overlooking your well, but what do you think this year is going to bring to you? Same as last year. Just keep winning. Winning is a habit. Bro. I keep winning. Daniel Preshaw. Yeah. It's not really about the records, like that's why I even chose that part. Like his records shit. Like he's got four losses, like twelve wins. You know, I don't say shit, but like, you know, it's records don't really mean shit to me. It's more about the challenge, you know what I mean? And for me, yes, there's pressure, but it's not about oh keeping my record intact. That's not what the pressure is. The pressure is other things, but I, I like pressure. Pressure is an acquired taste. It's something that I'm used to. 
even this, a lot of people who don't deal with pressure very well, they will fold. Like, this is a little bit doing down now, but initially when it was a lot of people, a lot of people like, the aren't me would fold. With something as little as this, but this is nothing to me. I'm just used to it. So I said it in my first UFC fight, I said, pressure makes diamonds. And I'm still shining, man. Where's the hair pick? I noticed it's missing today. Man, I stay strapped. There we go. Strapped. We I keep that thing on me, man. I keep that thing on me. Right now, where did you get that thing? That's this. Uh, well, my friends saw it down. I go to online. But, you know, I got to represent. This is cultural. This is cultural. A lot of people don't understand. And they think some people were trying to say, like, oh, he's trying to appropriate American culture. He thinks he's American. I'm like, fuck you. You don't understand. This, this was way before slaves came to fucking America. This is something that you will never understand because you're ignorant. So... Don't disrespect my culture to those who like to disrespect it. But this is, this is, yeah, this is something that I don't just wear for fun, you know? I wear to make a statement. Yeah, yeah, they, they don't have any right to say anything yeah. about that. So, you, uh, so I, I noticed you got the Leatherman jacket on. Did you see that DC just got an award from you? Saw the 50 clean test, and they gave him actually a nice custom. I wonder uh, how many do I jacket. have? I'm gonna have to ask Jeff Nowitzki, how many do I have? Because I need me another jacket as well. That's pretty cool, 50 clean test. I've been tested a lot of times, but not 50. I've been tested, I'll be close. I'll be close to 50. Maybe like, I'm over halfway, definitely. I'm over, over halfway, 20, maybe 30. But yeah, I'm gonna have to see Jeff then. Yeah, if you see DC, check out that jacket. It's, it's pretty I mean, slick. he's my size as well, so I'm gonna have to see that jacket. Look, look, look at that up there, champ. Look at right behind you. Is this everything you imagine? I mean, it, it seems like you're first on the scene and just, sort of just ran through the division and you did a lot of, people were saying that you were hype and this and that and then you took out guys hyped. that you were supposed to that, you, that were supposed to beat you yeah I'm still hype I mean I'm always hype I, people I still see it I still hear it you know oh, it's just another hype job but I like hype hype has been a part of my life throughout my my, my youth and, and, and an adult you know and I like hype I even like the word hype I like to hype things up you know, even in, in crump dancing, when you when you, when, you're when your friends are dancing, you hype them up, you hype them up, and I I love hype, you know. So I just embrace it. I love you. Oh, I'm not a hype show. I'm not, fuck that. I embrace it. So I am the hype train. I keep running people over. Speaking of dancing, I don't know if you had a chance to hear Yoel's comments yesterday about your dance off that you had. You know, he said that you tried. He kind of seemingly I uh, thought he got the better try. of you in that no, one. No, he did. He, he, he killed it think, off. Think he, we're gonna have a rematch at some point? Or? Oh, the fight's the rematch. And like I said, he can win the battle. He needs to win something. Because <laughs> he ain't winning this. So, um, yeah, I mean, he stole the moment. And I can't, I mean, I've, I've been to many dance-offs and I've lost a few. So it's, I know when someone takes the moment, you can't try and regain the moment. It's, it's done. It's gone. Um, but, yeah, I mean, he can think that. Whatever helps him sleep at night. But, yeah, he, can, he needs something to win. So that's what he's going to be remembered for. The guy who beat me in a dance battle that I didn't even try. I mean, sometimes, you know, the lion doesn't have to roar with the sheep around. Do you feel respected as a, a champion, or is it a case where you feel you need to beat someone like Romero to get that, more of that respect? No, I think I, I am respected as a champion. Like, a lot of people did, oh, okay, okay, he's not, he, he's for real, he's for real, after they talk shit about me for so long. But mm, for me, I still feel disrespected as well because it's going to be part of it. It's part of it. I already expected this before I got in the UFC, before I got cha became champion. I already expected me to be still, like, I'm going to defend this a few more times, and I'm still going to be a hype job. I'm still going to be all, they just, like, people just, whatever helps him sleep at night. Nah, he got, he got his fights handpicked. Dude, they gave him a, after this fight, they all say, no, he's a beast, he's this, he's that, he's that. Well, nah, they gave him an old Romero. Romero in his prime, or Anderson in his prime. Anderson in his prime would have suffered the same consequences that he did to fighting me because it's his skills. They, they, they don't understand. That was a battle of brains and the skills. I was doing to Anderson what he was doing to people who had no idea what he was doing for years. So, yeah, they're all going to say the same shit. So I'm, I'm expecting. I'm used to it. How do, you, how do you see the fight actually playing out in your head? Fight? How do I see the fight playing out in my head? There's three different ways I see it ending. But the first way, the first way I, I feel that's going to go is, is a 5 nil shutout. Oh, no. Oh, what? Oh, yeah. My bad. Oh, shit. Boogers. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Good looking out. Let's get out of the way. It's going to be a gift now. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> there you go. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, it's going to be a 5 nil shutout. That's how I see it. The rest, the other two, I'll save for my myself. Your confidence, obviously, is a big part of who you are. I mean, so then, there's not many, yeah, not many fighters that would stand up here in front of reporters and pick their nose and yeah, do what you that. do. Have you always been this confident? Is it something that just you, you grew up with, or 
Was there a time in your Definitely life where you didn't, didn't grow up with it. I think it's just accepting. We all pick our noses. You all take a shit, don't you? We all fucking have sex. Well, somehow in this day and age, everyone likes to. I bet you, Joanna couldn't do this. Or Wendy Zhang couldn't do this. Why? It's a, it's it's a nipple. It's a fucking nipple. Like, do you get what I mean? I can do this because I'm a man. It's International Women's uh, Month. But they can't do that because they're women. Everyone likes titties. Everyone sucked on titty when they was a kid. You know, so everyone likes to act like this. Is this fucking weird filter the TV and Puritan ideology has and like, oh, let's protect the minds of the children. It's like, kids are smarter than you think. I have real conversation with kids and I'm just like, I don't have to censor myself around you because you're smart enough to comprehend what I'm saying and how I'm saying, you know, but yeah, I'll do it again just because I know I can because I'm a man. Let's Shout out to women, that, man. Though. International Women. International Women's Month. You mentioned International Women's Month yeah. and about what the women can and cannot do. What do you it's think silly. about it? What do you it's think silly. about it? I have to have like a nipple fucking like Janet Jackson, you know, to, to, to not do that. But like, it's like, it's so stupid. <laughs> What do you think about the, your co-main event, Whaley and Joanna? That I've and said it before. That's fight of the night, or it's gonna be a, a like a real quick fight. Well, you guys don't understand, man. These girls, these are the two best. Okay, not in the top three, top four best fighters in the women's division. My favorite, anyway. There's a few, Rose, you know, Valentina, but these two, I think it's gonna be fight of the night. I think it's gonna be a cracker. And people are sleeping on this fight. No one's really talking about this fight. I know it's because they're women and oh, women fighting this and that. Because some people still have that ideology. Fuck, you want to see a real girl fight? Watch the comment event. Just trust me. Oof, I can't wait, man. That I, I, like for me, I'll be getting ready for my fight at the time, so I'll be watching it. With the, it's not gonna be me watching. It's gonna be the other guy watching it. So I'll really be as enjoying it as a fan. But I'll definitely watch it after after my fight. When I get back to the hotel, when I've done my party and all that stuff. I'll definitely watch it again on, on, on ESPN Plus and then really enjoy it for what it is because it's going to be a fucking cracker. I wish I could just watch it as yeah. a fan. And what do just... you make of UFC and how it promotes female fighters as yeah. opposed to other combat sports, yeah. uh, particularly boxing? Mm, I think they're doing better than boxing. I know Clarissa Shields is the one right now who's doing, she's doing kind of her own self-promotion. She's doing very, very good at it with um, her own self-promotion, but... Um, I think the UFC do a very good job. I mean, look at what Ronda Rousey did. She fucking kicked the doors in for the women. If not for her, you guys wouldn't, like, women wouldn't really be fighting in the UFC because Dana said no. And Dana, I mean, yeah, I feel the UFC do a good job of money women, yeah. You mentioned Edmund Shabazian earlier. Is he a guy, maybe he's a little more soft-spoken than, than you were on the come-up, but is he a guy that kind of reminds you yourself a little bit, that this young kid fighting often, uh, people are doubting his abilities and he goes in there and improves them wrong? Is I don't think people, are people doubting him. I, 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 I don't know because I don't really follow him like that, but I don't. He's good. He beat Brad Tavares in one round. I was there live, and I was like, that was what made me take notice. Like, oh shit, he beat a guy that I know is tough, and beat him with a move that I can do as well. But he set it up nicely, one, and then a, and a left head kick, set him up nicely. So that made me that, that let me know his IQ is different from the rest of these middleweights, and I'll see him later on at some point. I mean. If I was being a dick, I'd fight him maybe in my next fight, get him out of the way. But that's a bitch move. That's a bitch move. I want, I want the best. I want him to grow. I want him to grow as a, as, as, a, as, a, as a contender. I want him to have a few more fights. So that way when I fight him, I'll fight the best version of him. I'm not trying to fight him early so that way I can get the jump on him. That's a bitch move. And you know who a bitch is. Yeah. That's a 50-55 for me, man. That's 50-55 because they both have things that each other cancels each other out. Fuck, that's a good fight. I, I'm a, I pray to the MMA gods that it happens this time. Is it fifth time's the charm? Sixth time's the charm? Whatever it is. Pray to the MMA gods. Offer a sacrifice. I'll offer a sacrifice so that way the MMA gods will be, will be pleased and the fight will go through in May, in April, sorry. And just one more prediction. Um, Kamar, Kamar Usman against Jorge Masvidal. Mm -hmm. I'll go Kamar on that one because that's my boy. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a tough fight because Jorge is a beast and I'm a fan of Jorge as well, but Nigel Power is different, man. I see the way Kamaru does not quit. He doesn't quit. The way he goes, he just constantly, like, 
Yeah, but me and Hoya were working together yesterday. Secret, I can't tell you what for. You guys know him? Ah, you'll never know until it comes out. We were working together yesterday and we were cordial, we were nice to each other, we were having fun, and it was cool. Even though I'm fighting this boy this weekend, you know? So, this is just the game we play. Like, Kamaru is friends with guys I'm gonna fight, or I have already fought. But in this fight, I'm going Kamaru. Um, is it, you talk about how Joel is, is going to add something to your legacy. And that's the reason why you wanted to fight him. But what exactly would it say about your career and your legacy? What, what exactly, what meaning would a, a win over Joel have on your legacy? I beat him the way I want to beat him. And everyone's going to be like, oh shit. Because Whitaker couldn't do it in 10 rounds. He couldn't do it to Whitaker in 10 rounds. And I did that to Whitaker. So if I you know, do what I want to do to him tomorrow or when, um, Saturday, everyone's going to be like, oh shit. He's a guy that hasn't really been finished properly in the UFC. He's a guy that everyone avoids. I shouldn't have to take this fight. I requested this fight because I didn't want to sit down and just chill. Don't give me too much time off. I like to stay active. So for me, I felt like, nah. He's a guy that when I beat him, everyone would be like, oh, fuck. Fuck. Like when they get the call to fight me, they're like, fuck. Oh, well, he's got the belt, so I have to fight him, but they're going to be like, fuck. <sighs> so yeah, I want to be that guy. I want to be the new boogeyman of the division. And uh, you, you talked about uh, Tyson Fury's walkout, and obviously you, you have great walkouts as well. Um, do you think almost, um, would you like to see that more in the UFC, sort of the pageantry and, and a little bit more of, of the walkouts? Because you're a bit of a showman, you know. Yeah, it's not for everyone. It's not for everyone. Not everyone can pull it off, so it definitely will get played out if it was a, if it was a staple in the UFC. But I'd rather, I'd rather everyone stay true to themselves. Just do, be you, do you. Enjoy, enjoy the show, and if, it's not for everyone. It's really not for everyone. So yeah, if it's for you, yeah, it's nice. Thank you, appreciate uh, it. Just got my eye. But yeah, do you, boo boo? I see you got a, a panic, a fanny pack yourself. I stay ready. I stay strapped. I keep that thing on me. What, what are you so? carrying? Then? Black opium, lip balm, my AirPod case. Oh, nice. And stuff. Okay. <laughs> Top secret. <laughs> Stuff. Yeah. All right, thank you, Izzy. All right, thank you. Thanks, guys. I gotta, I gotta steal Izzy now. No worries. Thank you, guys. Thank you, guys. Photo.